Let's go ahead and start. Um, picking up where we left off on page 907 in the, um, the epitaph that Johnson wrote for Shakespeare, to Shakespeare. I believe we left off with line 14. So picking up with line 15. But thou art proof against them. And indeed, above the ill fortune of them or the need. Okay. Thou what? Or thou who? Notice the very opening. To draw new envy, Shakespeare, on thy name am I thus ample to thy book and fame. He seemingly referring to both Shakespeare, the person, the individual, and this volume. Okay, the first folio of Shakespeare's poetry, excuse me, of Shakespeare's plays. It does not include the poetry. Okay? It does not include the sonnets, for example. I think I'd have to double check. Totally drawing a blank. I'd have to, how do I remember? I don't think it includes, <coughs> it includes any of the long poems. So, but thou art a proof against them. I think that I was referring to both the book and the person. And indeed, above the ill fortune of them or the need. I therefore will begin. That is, it's almost like Johnson is suggesting everything from 1 through 15, through 16a, the first half of line, uh, excuse me, 17a, the first half of line 17, everything from 1 through there, preamble. Preamble or, or preface is, this is the word before the really important word. And what's really important, now, I'm getting to it. Soul of the age. Now, soul of the age. I'm using the cap there for age. What does that imply? The soul of something is its what? The soul of a person, assuming one accepts the existence of a soul, is that person's what? Essence. Essence, okay. You're gonna hate me. What do you mean by essence? Um, The consciousness, the, the, the I in the individual, right? Okay. The me. It's the enlivening force in the body. Because what's a body without a soul? Corpse, right? Cadaver. Piece of meat. Soul of the age. It's as if, I'm going to use another image, and this image is going to get really important with John Dunn. <coughs> I, think, I think I've alluded to this before. Think of a sphere, right? Not a circle, a sphere. So imagine for the moment, I really have to do this. Imagine for the moment, I'm holding a glass ball. It's clear glass, so you can see right through it to me and I can see through to you, but I'm holding it like this, right? The Renaissance believed, for the most part, that the world was constructed, here's Earth at the center, was constructed of one, two, Nine. Nine, the universe, was constructed of nine concentric spheres that surrounded the earth. Right? The first one was the moon. The sun was one, Jupiter, the planets, etc., etc. Out here, beyond the ninth sphere, you have what's called the Empyrean. That's where God dwells, or as Aristotle put it, the primum mobile, the first mover. Okay? 
Soul of the Age is playing on this idea that each one of these spheres has a ruling intelligence. It has something that governs that sphere, that controls it. Okay? This is the age. And this is Shakespeare. Johnson is suggesting Shakespeare is the enlivening component, the, the, the intellectual mover of the age that Johnson lived in. Okay? He's the guiding intelligence. Soul of the age. The applause, delight, the wonder of our stage. It's like saying Shakespeare is the applause of the stage, as well as Shakespeare is the delight of the stage, and Shakespeare is the wonder of the stage. My Shakespeare rise. Now, I don't think that's referring to the book. It's not like he's saying, levitate, you know, oh book. He's saying, Shakespeare, come back from the dead. My Shakespeare, rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee room. He's talking about, and you can go there today, Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. Right? Poet's Corner is literally an area, oh, it's not much bigger than this room. In fact, it's... Probably smaller than this room. Probably from about here to that wall and about that distance back. Where famous poets were buried. Chaucer, okay, Edmund Spencer, Edmund Spencer, writer of the Fairy Queen and stuff. John Beaumont, a contemporary of uh, John Beaumont, Francis Beaumont. We've got a gloss. Francis Beaumont. Contemporary of Shakespeare's and Johnson's, a little bit older. Okay. Um, actually, take that back. He's younger than, 20 years younger than Shakespeare. Um, they're all buried in Westminster Abbey. Okay. Later poets are also buried there, or they are at least commemorated there. That is, the statue is put up to honor that person. So, he's saying, I will not lodge thee. I'm not going to bury you, metaphorically speaking next to Chaucer or Spencer or Beaumont. Nor am I going to ask them to, you know, like Hagrid says to people in the picture, punch over. I'm not going to ask you to, them to move over and squeeze a little room for you. That's why he says, rise. Come alive. Not literally. You, you don't belong where the dead are. Why? Thou art a monument without a tomb. Okay? Now, I think that's referring to the book. You want to you want to see Shakespeare? Read the plays. As if Johnson is saying. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still, while thy book doth live. And we have wits to read, and praise to give. Remember sonnet... 18, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long as this and this is life to thee. Johnson, as long as we have wits to read and praise to give, this book will give life to Shakespeare. Okay? I'm one of the reasons why I'm one of those old, very old traditionalists, you know, I'm about the last one alive, I think, who says every English major ought to be required to take a course in Shakespeare because he's the pinnacle of English writing. I don't mean the pinnacle. Nobody else 
you know, is as good. I just mean nobody expressed what he expressed in the manner that he expressed it as well as he expressed it in terms of the range of human emotions, existence, you know, experiences and such. So, that I not mix thee so, that is, with the other poets, kind of like in Poets' Corner, that I not mix thee, commingle thee with them, my brain excuses, or excuses. I mean with great, but disproportioned muses. Muses, notice muses is capitalized. He says, I'm not going to mix you with great, but disproportioned, out of proportion, is what that, is what that means. All right? Example. He said, I'm not going to compare you to what some people call great writers. He's saying, Shakespeare, you stand alone. For if I thought my judgment were of years, if my evaluation of you depended solely upon the years in which you wrote and such, I should commit thee surely with thy peers. That is, other writers at the time Shakespeare was writing. And he gives us a list. And tell how far thou didst our Lily, John Lilly, guy wrote a little book, not quite little, book called Euphues or the Golden Wit, okay? Read about it later. And tell how far thou, how far thou didst our Lily outshine or sporting kid, you've got footnotes, you know, Thomas Kidd, John Lily, or Marlowe's mighty line, Christopher Marlowe, Tamburlaine, Dr. Faustus, Edward II. I've seen two of those at the Globe Theater. They're, they're performed, they're seldom read. You, you don't go to Books A Million or Barnes & Noble or a major bookstore and browse through and go, oh, look there, there's, you know, Tamerlane by Christopher Marlowe and pick it up and read it for your own. Most times when people read one of those plays, it's because it's assigned in a course, okay? And though thou hadst small Latin and less Greek, one of the most quoted lines in English literature, because it's taken to me by the anti Stratfordians, the people who say William Shakespeare, Stratford on Avon, was not the Shakespeare who wrote the plays. They rely on this because they think Johnson is saying Shakespeare had no Latin and Greek. Okay? Not true. We know the author of the plays had to have known Latin and Greek because some of the source material was only available in Latin, had not yet been translated into English. When Johnson says, though thou had small Latin and less Greek, look at, the, look at your footnote. By Johnson's standards, this means something less than erudite and expert fluency. Expert fluency. I can pick my way through really clumsily a text in German or a text in French or a text in Latin. I'm not fluent in any of those by any means. I've studied all of them, okay? Minimum of a year for all of them. Latin, two years. Uh, Greek, I can't do anything with. Old Norse had essentially a year of. I can pick my way through the Old Norse sagas as long as I have a dictionary with me. But I can, you know, figure out the endings and all that kind of stuff. What Johnson is saying is, compared to me, Ben Johnson, who was an expert in classics, all right? Might be helpful to understand what Shakespeare's understanding of Latin and Greek would have been. When he went to the King Edward school, King Edward VI school, you know, and he went for a period probably of five to six years, would have begun around five or six, finished at 11 or 12. Almost all of that would have been conducted in Latin and Greek. He wouldn't take an English literature course 
for example. He would have taken courses in Latin. He would have still been using, you know, the old medieval method of education of the trivium and the quadrivium, right? He would have been learning Latin. He would have been learning geometry. He would have been learning astronomy. He would have been learning philosophy. He would have been learning grammar, grammar meaning Latin and such, okay? So, you know, how would they go about doing that? Well, you would start out, obviously, very, very basic means. But by the time he would have finished, you know, 11 or 12 years old, the headmaster would have asked the students, would have given the students, for example, a text in Latin, say, a passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars, right? And it would have been on a, like a blackboard, and they would have had little boards in front of them, um, a piece of slate, and like chalk, or possibly even a, what's called a horn book, which is a book that essentially has wax in it, right? And they would have that material on the board, and the instructor would say, the headmaster would say, now translate this into English. And so the student would look up and translate it, word for word into English. That's the first part. Instructor would come around, would read each, if there was a mistranslation, if it wasn't fluent, if it wasn't mellifluous, whack, you know, smack on the wrists or on the fingers with like a ruler, okay? And not just that, you know, oh, bad boy. I mean, bruises kind of thing. That's the first part of the translation exercise. The second part of the translation exercise is the teacher would remove what's on the board and tell them, okay, now take what you have there, give them another slate, translate that back into the light. Here's the kicker. It had to match. So it had to appear perfectly. And it was word in the spelling perfectly. So that gives you an idea that, you know, Shakespeare could read, translate, think in Latin. Okay. It's been suggested that somebody who finished a grammar school education in Shakespeare's day probably had the equivalent today of like an undergraduate degree in classics. Okay, what does that mean? Four years of Latin and Greek, college level today, would be equivalent to what an 11 or 12 year old would have had through five or six years of Latin and Greek instruction in Shakespeare's day, okay? So little Latin and less Greek is compared to binge. It's, by our standards, it's a lot. So, and though they had small Latin and less Greek, it's like, you know, gotta get this little dig in you because Johnson is jealous, it's gonna be clear, or maybe not jealous, envious of Shakespeare's abilities. And though they had small Latin and less Greek, and, uh, excuse me, from thence to honor thee, from thence, that's from there, what's the where? Latin and Greek. So from ancient Rome and ancient Greece, I would not seek for names. I would not seek. I wouldn't have to go, let's see, who can I compare Shakespeare to in Latin and Greek? Hmm. No, I would immediately call out. Thundering Aeschylus, all right? Euripides and Sophocles. Aeschylus and Sophocles, the two great tragedians. Euripides, who wrote also, you know, some tragedy, but also comedy. Pacuvius, Accius, him of Cordova dead, ancient Roman playwright. So, we get the ancient Greek dramatists, the biggies, like the trinity of Greek dramatists. And then we get the major Roman dramatists. So Greek, uh, he's compared them to the greatest, even though he had little Latin and less Greek. He says, I would call them forth to life again. 
Why? To hear thy buskin tread and shake a stage. Buskin, boot worn by actors in Greek tragedies and so a metonym for tragic drama. So I would call them for it to say, take a seat and watch his tragedies. Why? Because Johnson is suggesting the greatest ancient tragedians in history would go, Rando, we can't hold a candle, Jim. Or when my socks were on, the image, the shoes worn by actors in comedies, he says, I would leave thee alone for the comparison. There weren't any ancient Greek tragedians or Roman tragedians, writers of tragic, uh, excuse me, comic writers, who he says can even come close to you. Of all, I would leave thee alone for the comparison of all the insolent Greeks or hockey Rome sent forth or since did from their ashes, like the phoenix that came, that were born from the ashes of these old ones, come, triumph my Britain. There's your nice nationalistic, you know, fervor, make England great again kind of a thing. What's he doing? In Shakespeare, Britain, rises above ancient Greece and Rome. Triumph, my Britain, thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. All scenes, all pictures, all images of anything European in dramas. Johnson is saying, anybody who wrote anything like that, in other words, anybody who portrayed life, Previously, they owe homage to Shakespeare. It's like they're saying, yeah, I kind of drew this from you. Or this is, think like in the sonnets, this is but an image of what you really did. Because an image is always what? You know, Sir Gowan is the image of Mary on the inside of the shield. Why? Because he doesn't have Mary herself. It's a copy. And every copy is imperfect. He was, oh, he said he was the soul of the age. He was not of an age, but for all time. Now notice he doesn't say soul of all time. But now he's gone back on what he said in line 20, 19, 18, seven, line 17, soul of the age. He was not of an age, but was for all time. And he's essentially saying Shakespeare is the soul of literature. Interestingly, a 20th century, early 21st century critic by the name of Harold Bloom, Odds are, you will, whatever your topic for your paper is, you will find something by Harold Bloom, either as editor of author or author on that work. Because he edited a series of works called 20th Century Critical Interpretations. He was the general editor of that series. And it covers just about all literature. Okay? He wrote a book about Shakespeare as being, as suggesting, Shakespeare, how did he, what was the uh, subtitle? Something like Shakespeare and the Invention of the Human. He essentially suggests all literature points to Shakespeare. All literature. Hebrew Bible, various other religious texts, and then, you know, quote unquote secular literature. It either points to or flows from Shakespeare. Okay? So, he was not of an age before all time. And all the muses still were in their prime. That is, they were young, vivacious, vibrant, full of life. When, like Apollo, he came forth to warm our ears. 
or like a mercury to charm. And you got a gloss down there. Gods of poetry and excellence, uh, eloquence. Right? What does that mean? The muses were still in their prime. He's talking about Shakespeare. You know, when Shakespeare was alive and writing, keep in mind, you know, I had the little timeline. Shakespeare stopped writing around 1612, four years before he died. So he was writing roughly 1590 to about 1612, period of 22 years. Johnson, and Johnson is now, this is being published, this poem, in 1623, seven years after his death, 10 or 11 years after Shakespeare stopped writing. And Johnson is suggesting, when Shakespeare is writing, the muses, the gods and goddesses of poetic invention were in their prime. Now, they're old and decrepit. <laughs> He's suggesting now they're not inspiring people. Nature herself was proud of his designs, enjoyed to wear the dressing of his line which were so richly spun and woven so fit as since, since Shakespeare's death, she will vouchsafe no other wit. Nature is talking about not people, the natural world. What's he, what's he mean? Nature, he says, the goddess, so to speak, really like. How Shakespeare portrayed the natural world. So much so that she, as an inspirer of the depiction of the natural world, she doesn't give that inspiration to any other wits writers. Who does that any other writers include? Ben Johnson. Hmm. The Merry Greek, sorry, Euripides is a, earlier I said Euripides wrote comedy. No, Euripides wrote, um, Euripides wrote only tragedy. Aristophanes is the comic poet, I was thinking of, comic playwright. The Merry Greek, Tart Aristophanes, Neat Terence, Witty Plautus, now not please. That is, we don't like watching plays by these authors today. In very few plays by Aristophanes, Terence, or Plautus are performed today. Aristophanes has a couple that still are. Clouds, for example, and what's the one set during the Peloponnesian Wars? It's one where all the wives of the soldiers say, we're not putting out, we're not having sex with you anymore. Stop the wars. Stop the wars, and we'll start having sex with our husbands again. It's a pretty good motivator for husbands to stop going out to war. I, I, I'm drawing a complete blank on the title. He's got another one, Clouds, where he pokes fun at Socrates. He has Socrates walking on the clouds. Why? Because he doesn't deal with real life. Everything's all theory with him. So, he says, these playwrights don't please us anymore. Why? Antiquated and deserted lie as they were not of nature's family. And the reason he's suggesting that is because they're too artificial. They, they don't we deal seemingly with real life. Right? Yet must I not Yet must I not give nature all. Nature. In other words, Shakespeare, you didn't write what you did solely because of the heavenly influence you received. It wasn't all inspiration. All right? Johnson's doing this for a reason. Which we'll get to in just a second. Thy art my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. Notice the distinction. Yeah, I'll remove this. Because I don't know that we'll get to done today. Yeah. 
He says, thy art must play a part. <clears throat> what does he mean? Nature, art. Nature's what in the modern, modern terminology? Every one of you, you know this. If I were a good Socratic teacher, I'd be able to ask the right questions to pull the information out of you. But you know exactly what we're what I'm talking about here. We just don't use these terms anymore. We do kind of with this one. We do in this context. Nature versus nurture. Okay. Well, what else is it? Was Michael Jordan born with the ability he had with a basketball? No. Are you sure? What did it take? A lot of practice. That is, yes, he did have some of this, right? What do we call that today? That's raw talent. It's innate ability. Michael Phelps was born to be in a pool. But it took what else? A lot of practice. I used to run marathons. I would never, I was not born a marathoner. But there are people who were born, like the guy just a couple of years ago ran the first, I think, sub two hour and three minute marathon. It's 26.2 miles in just over two hours. It's like a four minute, 15 second, four minute, 20 second mile for 26 miles. Most people can't even run that. I think the fastest mile I ever ran was about a 5.30 and nearly died afterwards, okay? So you have that talent, but then it takes what? Training, practice. That's, that's the art. What's he mean by this? Skill, okay? So go back to what he said. Yet must I not give nature all? He's saying Shakespeare did not just write down with a sheaf of paper, get an inkwell and a pen, and just start writing, and it was perfect for him. What do you have to do? Scratch words out of it, scratch others in. Now, we do have some manuscripts of some plays that do have Shakespeare's handwriting in them where he assisted others. Not a lot, but I only two or three that I think, okay? And even, you know, his own name I've mentioned before. We've got six, six signatures. He spells his name three different ways. Thy art must enjoy a part. Why? For though the poets matter, nature be, notice, the poet. He doesn't say, for though your matter, Shakespeare's, the stuff he was writing about. Nature be. What does it mean? What else can you write about? He doesn't mean nature, the trees, the birds, the grass, the sky. That's part of nature. What else is part of nature? And we have this metaphor that we use today. <laughs> it's about 100, 200 years old. That we are somehow, we humans, are somehow removed from nature. We talk about, you know, if there's a big storm or a sudden tornado, how, the, how nature targeted someplace, or a hurricane has something in its crosshairs. What does that imply? We are at war with nature rather than we're part of nature. You know, nature is the created, the existing order, whatever it is, all right? So that's the matter, that's the material. That's what poets write about. He says, For though the poets matter, nature be his art, doth give the fashion. What's the fashion? The clothing. The appearance. 
His art, his skill, his technique is what dresses it for us. And that he who casts to write a living line must sweat, such as thine are, parentheses, it's a little, you know, a positive statement. Your lines, Shakespeare, are living. It's like he's saying, you created life. And someone who wants to do that, right, who cast to write a living line, must sweat. Sweat implying what? How many of you are looking for him? You just can't wait to write the paper for this class or another class. I mean, you're just dying. In fact, you've already written it. It's just there and it's perfect, you know. Yeah, lots of grins. Most people don't like to do that. Why? It's hard. It's not hard like out there digging ditches with a pick and shovel. That's a different kind of hard. It's intellectual hard, all right? And strike the second heat upon the muse's anvil. What's the first heat? Poss you know, a realm of possibilities. One of them is, because notice, it's the muse's anvil. What's an anvil for? For shaping metal. You get that metal hot, you put it on an anvil, and you hit it. Okay? Strike the second heat. The first heat is starting to shake. The second heat, you cool it, you temper it. That's when you're giving it its final shape. It's almost like the first heat is the muse's inspiration. It's J.K. Rowling on that train from Manchester to London. Harry Potter, a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday, his parents were killed by a dark wizard, and the dark wizard wants to kill him. What did she have to do then? It's J.R.R. Tolkien grading those entrance exams to Oxford. And he turns, I held this in my hand, he turns the page on a blue book and writes in pencil in a hole in the ground and a dot. It's like dot, dot, dot. Very next day, what the hell's a hobbit? Tolkien had never seen that word before. He'd never read that word before. He'd never heard that word. What does every poet slash writer have to do? You come up with a topic for your paper. It's just enough to go, Dr. Sherman, I want to, you know, I sent out some possible topics today. I want to write about who WH is in that dedicatory epistle to the sonnets. And I'll go, that's an A. Just, that's all. You don't need to fill that. Just, that's an A topic. Good job. I want to write about, you know, the portrayal of green in Sir Gowdy, that's an A topic. How many of you would like that? Yeah, everybody's, you know, hands go up. Why? That's the first inspiration. The second part, now comes the hard work. Turn the same and himself with it that he thinks to frame, to hammer into shape. Or for the laurel, that is, instead of the laurel, what's the laurel? It's the prize given to poets. He may gain a scorn. Why is it you can go to a bookstore today and find a table that is full of what are called remainders? Only oh, cool books, right? Six months right here, so. What are the remainders? Those are the books that don't sell. Those are the books that a publisher might have given somebody in advance, and they lost their money on that. Okay? J.K. Rowling does not have that problem. Her books sell. Okay? There are an awful lot of authors whose books don't sell. In fact, there are publishers that are called vanity presses, academically speaking. Vanity presses. A scholar writes a book, and a university press won't publish it. Or maybe not a university, but another kind of academic press won't publish it. Why? 
because the press has farmed that book out called to what are called blind reviewers, scholars in the field. They look at it and they say, not worth publishing. Here's why. There are academic press, so-called academic presses, where the press will say, yeah, we'll publish your book. You have to guarantee sales of 500 copies. How do you guarantee sales of 500 copies? You pull out your credit card and you pay them to publish that book. And then you give them a list of suggested libraries, and they send that book for free to those libraries. On the off chance that somebody will be browsing through the library and look at the book, and you might get a citation. Woo! All right? So, that's the scorn. <laughs> for a good poet, all this is to get to this point, to this line, for a good poet's made as well as born. Made how? Through hard work. Now, there are some poets, apparently, within the English tradition, or writers, who were born writers. Um, John Milton, Paradise, author of Paradise Lost. By the time he gets around to writing Paradise Lost, he's blind. Blind, blind. Like, blind, blind. He dictates it to one of his daughters. He can't read proofs. He can't read galleys of that book. He dictates it, and that's how it is. Samuel Johnson, 17th, 18th century, 18th century poet, apparently would write first drafts and they would send to the press. Hate people like that. Just absolutely despise them. Okay? C.S. Lewis was apparently like that with some of the stuff he wrote. J.R.R. Tolkien was not. Look at, you know, his little essay on fairy stories. Multiple drafts. I mean, I've held these. I worked with them. It's, and things crossed out. And it took him years to produce the printed one. Okay. Lord of the Rings took him 17 years to write multiple drafts. And even then he says, it's still got some problems, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Tell you what they are. So, a good poet's made as well as born. you got to have the ability, but that's not enough, Johnson is saying. So, is Johnson giving us inside baseball here? Inside information on Shakespeare's writing practice? Or, another possibility has been thrown out by critics, is Johnson no longer talking about William Shakespeare, but talking about Ben Johnson and his writing practice. He would, he would get an idea, but then he had to hammer and tongs that thing it was just work, work, work. Because then he says, and such wert thou. We don't know that. We don't know what Shakespeare's actual writing practice was. Why? We don't have drafts. For an awful lot of poets, we don't have drafts. For an awful lot of poets, from the 17th century forward, we do have. We have multiple drafts. Or maybe not poets, but novelists. Look at James Joyce's Ulysses. It is one of the most enigmatic texts in the history of writing. Why? Because he kept revising it. And there are public, there are editions of it today that show all of the changes over the years. Sometimes in different colored print, sometimes in a different font, sometimes with you know arrows and X's and things crossed through showing the author's intentions as they change over the years. Look how the father's face lives in his issue. Look at the plays, and what is Johnson saying? You will see Shakespeare. Go back to Sonnet. One. 
where the speaker says, no, look, it's on a two. How much more praise deserve thy beauty's use if thou could answer this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse. You want to see Shakespeare? Look at the plays, Jonathan is saying. Even so, the race of Shakespeare's mind and manners brightly shines in his well-turned in true filed lines. Well turned and true filed. Jonathan's father was a bricklayer, a skilled craftsman, right? He's just used two terms from two hand trades. Well turned refers to turning wood on a lathe, foot power, you got a rope and you do this and the wood turns and you hold a gouge and you shape it, okay? Well filed refers to metalworking, where you file off little pieces and you sharpen something or you cut a shape out of something. It is well turned in true filed lines, in each of which he seems to shape a lance. Pun. Shake, lance. A lance is another word for what? A spear. Now, some critics have looked at that and said, ah, but notice he seems to shake a lance. Why doesn't he say, in each of which he comes up with another word for seems, because seems is a, is a not conjunctive, It's a thing that subject, thing that indicates a condition contrary to fact. Okay. He doesn't say shake a spear. So the anti stratfordians kind of go, this is Johnson giving away. He appears to be a shake spear, but he's not. How do we know? Because he doesn't say shake a spear. He says shake a lance. It's not the same thing as brandished at the eyes of ignorance. What does that mean? In which he seems to shake a lance as brandished at the eyes of ignorance. He's finishing the talk about literary creation. Shaking a lance is you know, a threatening action. At the eyes of ignorance, People who don't understand. And I think Johnson is kind of showing his, uh, what do I want to call it, air of superiority here. I really understand Shakespeare, but an awful lot of people out there don't. Sweet Swan of Avon. Avon. Why? That's where Shakespeare's from. Stratford upon Avon. The upon is about the river slash stream that runs through the town. Sweet swan of Avon, what a sight it were to see thee in our waters yet appear. It gets back to the arise, Shakespeare. Okay. And make those flights upon the banks of Thames that so did take Eliza and our gems. It's not Thames and James. It needs to rhyme. It's an I rhyme. It's not a literal rhyme. Okay? But stay. So, what is, man, would it be great to see you again? Who so delighted Queen Elizabeth and King James? But stay. I see thee. In the hemisphere. Wait, he had been the sweet swan of Avon, who, notice the next passage to it refers to a place, is the Thames, the central river in London. So the swan went from the Avon to the Thames, but now the swan has ascended into the heavens. Why? 
Because Johnson has just apotheosized Shakespeare, made him into a god. For what purpose? Not to be amused, to be amused, to inspire British writers. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere advanced, that is, rising, and made a constellation there. Shine forth, thou star of poets. And we're back to the spheres. Why? This is why people read their horoscopes, because of the movement of the spheres, the stars, and the planets, and the influence they have down here on Earth. So, shine forth, thou star of poets, shine on us, and with rage or influence, chide or cheer the drooping stage. Rage, the quote-unquote climate change. The sun's getting too bright. The sun's getting too dim. See, I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have to worry about global warming, but late 19, mid 1970s, the big fear was global cooling. We were going to have another ice age come. Right? Rage or influence? Influence is kind of. Rage is where you go and grab someone and pull them. So, Really strong influence or just, you know, slight suggestion. Chide or cheer the drooping stage. Chide. How do you chide a performance on a stage? Puck tells us this at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream. That we escape the serpent's hiss. That's boo. <laughs> boo, you know, it's bad. And in Shakespeare's day, it wasn't just the hiss. People brought stuff with them to the plays to throw. Or they just scooped up what was down in the pit in the yard where they were standing. People relieved themselves where they stood in Shakespeare's day in the yard in the globe. The, the ground was crushed, nuts and dirt, right? And then they relieved themselves and they literally scoop up and throw it at the stage if they didn't like what was being performed. Talk about a tough audience, right? Or cheer. Way to go. Good performance. You know, because what does Puck ask for? That we may escape the serpent's hiss. Give us thy hands. He's begging, by the way. <laughs> it's the poet's way going. Please tell me you like my perform my production. The drooping stage. Why is something droop? What's it lack if it droops? Stability. Foundation. My wife and I went to a, a, buy an a old pie safe yesterday from a guy over in Eagle. And he said, want to take a tour? Big old house. We're, sure. Tells us that we're touring it. It's for sale for like $1.2 million. Part of the house, the original part of the house, was built in 1790. Other parts of the house were built before the Civil War. And it was all put together <laughs> later. I mean, the original part was a downstairs room and an upstairs room. The kitchen was a log cabin over here. And it's been moved over and over. And then the rest of this was kind of all tacked on. But we were, were walking around, and you go in a room, and the floor, you know, kind of goes like this, and kind of goes like this. Why? Houses settle over age. They, parts of them droop. You can see front porches or roof lines that are drooping. They lack vitality. They lack life. They lack support. The stage is drooping. Why? Shakespeare's been dead for six years. Seven years, excuse me. Which drooping stage, which since thy flight from hence hath mourned like night? 
in despair's day. The stage is mourn like night, like it's all in darkness, in despair's day. Why? When were plays performed? When were they put on? During the daylight. They didn't have nighttime performances, unless you were in an indoor theater, like the Black Friars Theater, where they had lighting, right? In despair's day, the stage despairs the day. Like, oh no, please don't. But, but, except for thy morning light. The stage despairs unless what's going on? A Shakespeare play. Go to London during the summer and you can see Shakespeare's plays everywhere. You can see them in churches, you can see them in parks, you can see them at the Globe, you can see them at the National Theater, you can see them at the Barbican, you can see them at the Swan of the Road. You can see them everywhere. You can see other plays too. You can see some of Johnson's and such. Shakespeare's, the audience will be packed. Johnson's, not always. Usually if somebody's seen a Johnson play, they're a real aficionado of the theater and such. Okay, stop there. Uh, so Monday we'll do other stuff by Dunn. We'll do the uh, Good Morrow canonization. Yeah, we still have um, another couple of days, so we'll easily get caught back on track. Um, I do have a quiz up for background to Renaissance and Shakespeare sonnets. That's due Sunday, I believe. Uh, remember, papers are due a week from Monday. Sent out an email this morning or post on D2L. 